We're going to talk a little bit about colorimetry and spectrophotometry. This is a topic that is not typically covered in college chemistry, especially in the textbooks, maybe in the labs. But in regard to spectrophotometry, you're going to see this assessed on your AP exam, either in part one and or in part two. And so this does have a specific learning objective that you will see. It falls into big idea one that we've talked about this year, but the learning objective is stated here. We want you to be able to design and or interpret the results of an experiment regarding the absorption of light to determine the concentration of that particular absorbing species that's in solution. The reaction we ran the other day in the lab where we had iron 3 ion reacting with biocyanate ion to generate a complex ion, you're going to run that reaction again, but we're going to analyze it differently. You will see that the deeper the color of the solution, the more concentrated the solution. And you can envision this, for example, say that you made lemonade and you taste it and you're like, ugh, too tart. You might add some water to it to dilute it and you would know the color would be lighter. It has a lower concentration. Also, for example, when you go to the bathroom in the morning, your urine is a very deep yellow-orange shade, but as you drink water during the day, you will find that the color of the urine is lighter and lighter. It is less concentrated. It has less solute per volume. So those would be two examples where you could physically look at the solution and get a feel for which one is more concentrated. In chemistry, sometimes that is enough. Other times, um, you would want to be able to determine the concentration, and spectrophotometry is a way that we can do it. You also might think back. Um, last year, you probably did a mini lab on dilution where you made a solution, and then you took a little bit of it, added some water, and made a second solution by dilution. And there again, you get that colorimetric type analysis. And we're going to talk about this in regard to Beer's Law. Again, colorimetry, you can just use your eye to get a feel for the concentration, which solution is more concentrated based on light intensity. With spectrophotometry, you can use those solutions and determine the exact concentration using an instrument known as a spectrophotometer, and we've got a couple in here. You can just use your eye and visually inspect it. You need to have an understanding of visible light in order to do that. We know about the Roy G. Biv spectrum, where you've got red, orange, yellow, etc., down to violet. Red light has a wavelength of about 70 nanometers, and blue light has a wavelength of about 400 nanometers. Anybody in AP Bio? No, so you didn't learn about Photosystem 1 and 2, P700, P680? No, no? Okay. Well, uh, you'll mention it to me next year after AP Bio. You know that visible light is a very, very small region of the electromagnetic spectrum. We talked about that last year. Uh, semester. You also know how these variables are related. For example, if you had the speed of light, you know that's equal to the wavelength times the frequency. What's the relationship between wavelength and frequency? Inverse is one increases, the other decreases. Energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency, what's the relationship between energy and frequency? Direct, all right? So you know the relationships between those variables. We talked about that in honors as well as AP. Another area that we have already discussed in AP, remember when we were talking about ionization energy, the energy required to strip an electron from the outermost shell, you can do that with visible light, visible light will eject electrons from the outermost shell. In contrast, you need 
types of radiation with a higher frequency and energy, such as X-rays, to eject inner electrons, and we talked about that with the PES profiles, and most of you were quite confident there. Remember also, we talked about microwaves. With microwaves, you will get molecules to rotate. We said that a microwave, you've got a dish in there, and the dish rotates. So with microwave types of radiation, you'll get the molecule to rotate. We also talked about molecular vibrations with infrared, where you know they start to pump iron, and we've looked at that before. But this all ties together, and making these linkages is critically important. We already mentioned the direct relationship between energy and frequency, and the inverse relationship between frequency and wavelength. You'll see the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy, the shorter the wavelength right there, the higher the energy. And we learned that back in honors. For those of you who like art, you will remember your complementary colors. You don't need to memorize them for AP. It's not an art class. But if given a color wheel or some type of chart to analyze, you would be able to show complementary colors. You essentially just make a line, the diameter of the circle, and you can show that colors on that line if the edges are complementary in nature. They combine to form white light so that the color of the compound seen by the eye is the complement of the color of light absorbed by a solution that is colored. For example, the solutions we made the other day, we had that orange color if you were using a spectrophotometer to detect the orange color, you would set it at the wavelength for blue light, and that's what we'll be looking to do. If they gave you such a chart, you would know that if you absorbed red light, if the solution absorbed red light, you would have a green colored solution but the wavelength would be set for the absorbed color, 700 nanometers. And in the lab, you are going to have an orange solution, and we will set the spectrophotometer at about 450 nanometers, which represents blue light absorption. So the, the wavelength is the color you have as your source? Correct, not the color of your solution. And see, for example, with chlorophyll, um, you know leaves are green typically, and that's because chlorophyll reflects green, but what it actually absorbs is red light. So if you were trying to analyze chlorophyll to any appreciable extent, you typically set the uh, spectrophotometer at about 680 to 700. And with photosynthesis, there are two photosystems, P700 and P680 and they both absorb red light. You had a question. You did learn about it, Marine? What? Like, with the three different types of colors, you get absorbed different light because of the different colors. Yeah, but when you learn with the P700. Right, right, but it, so it's similar. Why. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. You have red algae, you have different types of algae, sure. All right, in regard to intensity, what we're looking at is if you have a colored solution, and you shine light at it. Um, you actually, I think, can see this in a subsequent slide. Um, I'll just draw it up. If you had a solution, and let's say it was orange, you would, and this is all inside the detector, it's a sloppy light bulb, but nonetheless, you shine light at it at some intensity going in, that's gonna be the initial intensity, and you will measure the intensity of light that actually passes through the solution. The darker the solution, less light will shine through and you will see that for light shining through a colored solution, the observed intensity of the color is found to be dependent on two variables. The thickness of the absorbing layer, that's the path length 
When you talk about path length, typically you are talking about the diameter of the tube as well as the concentration of the colored species. So if you had a bunch of tubes, this is your side view, and you can see better in the bird's eye view if you were looking right down into it. This solution has a greater color, if you will, and you will see that that will correspond with a higher concentration. And we'll talk about that. If you only have one color, it's pretty straightforward. If you have a single color, it demonstrates the effect of either concentration or path length. Typically, we're going to be calculating concentration based on the absorbance. If you have more than one color, it's far more complicated. You've got to do um, a double comparison. You know that purple comes from red and blue, so you can look at red and look at blue and sort of blend them together. I'll show you that. The other factor that you're going to need here, and you'll see this in the pre-lab I'll show you, is the dilution factor. And the abbreviations here are slightly different than what you might be uh, familiar with. I would have run it through you, run it by you, as M stock V stock is equal to M nu V nu, where you know that this is the nu or the dilute solution, and this is the stock or concentrated solution. This is what's on your shelf, and this is what you want to make. So for example, if you know this and you know this, sometimes you're not given the new volume directly, but you can determine it. If you have a stock of three mils and you add five mils of water to it, what's the volume of your new or dilute solution? Eight. So you can easily figure that out if it's not given directly and then you can calculate the concentration of your new solution. And we'll be doing that in the pre-lab in a few minutes. You already know how to do it. And they're showing you right here, if you have three drops, one, two, three, of a dye, let's say a purpley color, and you add five drops of water, your total volume at the end is eight drops. That's the volume of the dilute solution. And this example here is a little bit different, but something you've probably seen before what is ppm parts, parts per million and you probably talked about that in environmental or marine science um this diagram is far too complicated and so we will just omit it um your instrument that you're going to be using is known as a spectrophotometer um, we have several in the lab here and we'll be using them the intensity of color can be given as a numerical value you can calculate it if need be, and the quantitative measurements that we're going to be looking at are transmittance and absorbance. Years ago, you could only read transmittance. You had to convert to absorbance, and then you could calculate concentration. The newer spectrophotometers, which we have, allow you to, calc uh, to read absorbance directly, making it a little bit easier. There are different types of spectrophotometers. There's a UV spectrophotometer that's gonna range in wavelength of 200 to 350. We don't have one of those, but we have a few visible light spectrum spectrophotometers, and they're gonna read in that wavelength region, obviously using visible light. And this is the crux of what they might ask you in May. Beer-Lambert law, known better as Beer's law, shows you the linear relationship between absorbance, capital A, and the concentration of the absorbing species. You will measure the absorbance of your solution, and then using Beer's law, you can calculate concentration C. Little a, or sometimes written as this epsilon right here, is the molar absorptivity. That's typically a constant, although in your lab you can solve for it. B 
is the path length, and that typically is one centimeter. It's the diameter of the cuvette or whatever you are measuring your sample in. And C is the concentration in molar. And the goal of Beer's Law is to calculate the concentration of various solutions. You'll get the absorbance from the spectrophotometer. The molar extinction coefficient is typically a constant or it will be provided. Path length is typically one centimeter, sometimes two centimeters, but they usually give it to you. And you'll be calculating concentration, and that's what your pre-lab goes into. Transmittance is equal to I, that's the intensity of light once it has passed through the sample over the initial light intensity. So you've got your light here, you shine it on your sample, that's what you start with, that's what you finish with once it goes through. Absorbance is equal to the negative log of the transmittance. Um, in terms of this T value, this is not the percent, it's the percent divided by 100. Be careful there. There's another way to calculate absorbance, which we'll take a look at in the lab. It'll be a little bit easier for you. This is very complicated. This is a SPEC 20 or a spectrophotometer, and this is exactly what you're going to be using. We'll go over this in more detail before the lab so that you're comfortable with it. But you've got a tungsten filament lamp emitting visible wavelengths of light. You can set the dial to whatever light region that you want. We'll set ours at 450 so it's going to see blue absorption. The solution is orange. And then I'll teach you how to zero it out with a blank. And inside the detector, you would, again, have a lamp, a lens, a monochromator. You'd have your sample in there, light here versus light that comes through. You detect it, and you have some sort of readout. And again, a little more detail. And when you do the lab, you'll be more comfortable with it. What I do want to show you are plots of absorption data. Be very careful with the axes here. You're going to see this, and I'll... Uh, we'll take a look at it together in a few minutes. Um, plots similar to the three below will need to be generated using some type of computer program or you could hand plot it. I want you really to focus here. You've got absorbance versus wavelength for blue dye. Absorbance on the Y, wavelength on the X. Be careful here. Note that you get a peak right here. The optimum wavelength for blue dye is going to be at that peak if absorbance is on the y-axis. That's going to be about 620 nanometers. What would the optimal wavelength be for absorbance of red? Around 520. When you've got two colors mixed together to make purple, you're going to get two overlapping here, and you'll have to read it at two different wavelengths, not a mix between the two. So if you look at the pre-lab that I gave you, on the back side, you're going to do all of it, but on the back side is an old AP style question. And this really threw the kids one year. They give you both transmittance and absorbance here. And again, just make sure you're reading the right graph. When you want to know the optimal wavelength, if you've got absorbance versus wavelength, you're going to go right here, trace down, and it looks like you're at about 510 nanometers for the optimal wavelength. If they give you percent transmittance versus wavelength, the optimal is going to be in the trough, T trough, right there. All right, so just make sure that you're familiar with the difference. Again, the optimal wavelength, look at absorbance, tippy top, or transmittance in the trough. All right, and you're going to read through this, but you'll get a better idea then.
just wanted to show you the difference between the two. That is not to be confused with an absorbance versus concentration curve. Usually, you don't make these. You might be asked to read them. What you can construct, and you will construct in the lab when we do um, a KEQ determination by spectrophotometry, is in a now you might have to generate this graph and then analyze it. This is absorbance versus concentration. What you'll be doing in the lab is you will have a solution that you have diluted several times, and then you will read the absorbances of your known concentrations. You will generate a series of points, and then you will make the best fit line either using a computer program or you can freehand it. A best fit line you have seen before, you saw it back in middle school math, you would have seen it in honors chemistry as well. You make a line, it doesn't have to go through every point, you're not connecting the dots like first grade. Sometimes you have a few points under or over. And then once you generate this curve, if you put a sample of unknown concentration into the spectrophotometer, and let's say, for example, that the absorbance is 1, you can determine its concentration because you can run along this line and then fall straight down, and it looks like you'd have a concentration of about 6 molar. If you had an absorbance of 0.4, you could trace across and then come straight down and it looks maybe like 2.2 or 2.1 molar. So you can determine the concentration from absorbance, which will be the goal. Make sure you don't confuse the two curves. They are very different. But you'll be generating this in the lab and analyzing. There are many, many applications of spectrophotometry chemical analysis, food safety analysis if they want to see contaminants in food, blood analysis, blood alcohol level, etc. If you've had way too much to drink, it's going to dilute down. And as a result, you would be able to do this type of analysis. DNA RNA concentration analysis. If you're looking for pesticides in certain regions, you can do this type of analysis too chlorine analysis in pools. So there are many practical applications of spectrophotometry. What you absolutely want to understand is how to analyze this curve, and in some instances, and you'll see this in the pre-lab, use Beer's Law to determine concentration from absorbance or maybe find one of the other variables. In regard to your pre-lab, that will be due on Thursday next year. Next year. <laughs> yeah, next week. <laughs> Your pre-lab assignment. It says, read an authoritative source for a discussion of spectrophotometry. You've had a little discussion of spectrophotometry here, but on Edline and also in the Google Classroom now, I have posted the beginning of this pre-lab with all the introductory information. It is a bit much to digest. In number two, it says, explain why it's necessary to work with 2.5 molar ammonia solution under the fume hood. Why would you work in a fume hood? Dangerous. It is dangerous. Why might it be dangerous? When you open a bottle of ammonia, what's the first thing you do? You go like this, because it stinks. And that's because ammonia is highly volatile. So when reagents are highly volatile, when they readily go from the liquid to the gaseous state, you want to work with them in a fume hood because they can be harmful to the environment as well as to you. Say it again. Yeah. So if I'm working there, I make sure that the hood is pretty low, so all the vapors are going up outside the building rather than in my classroom or up my nose. Is it like the outside of the 
Well, keep in mind that what you might be releasing compared to the great outdoors, what you're releasing is so minuscule compared to a big surrounding. So Can it's just going to go. Sure, I use it all the time. But I use the one in the chemical storeroom more because that's typically where I aliquot noxious reagents that can be dangerous to you. Oh, we can take a field trip. We've never been in there. No, 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 that's not a chemical storeroom. Oh. No, it's where we keep all of our dangerous reagents and we can discuss yeah, it no, after. All righty. <laughs> All right, in regard to number three, it's going to ask you a series of questions and you'll read through this. They give you percent transmittance, they want absorbance, and then they want the concentration of copper two ion. That will be the dilute one. Kids have struggled with this over the year. So I have made a handy dandy cheat sheet right here that tells you how to walk through. You can calculate absorbance by doing two minus the log of the percent transmittance. And if you do it this way, you can leave the percent as such. Now, some of you are very computer savvy. You can either do this in Google uh, Sheets or you can do it in Excel. I'd like to be able to completely transition to Google Sheets, but it is done the same way in Excel. So I'll point it out here. I can do it in Google Sheets afterward if you wish. I'm just more familiar with the functionality here. I have put those transmittances in. I don't know if you're familiar with the function buttons. But if I go in here and I hit equals, I am now using a function button. <coughs> Ta-da, we fixed it. So then if you get it in here and you <coughs> copy it, you can paste straight down and it plugs in all your, va all your um, values so you don't have to keep doing it on your calculator. So I'll leave that up for you to play like with. Until Thursday of next year, right? Yes. I'll let you grab those values in a sec. The other hints are all listed here, and I think that will help you tremendously. When you make your graph, remember that all graphs need titles and all axes need to be labeled completely. Thank you. So all graphs need titled and all axes need to be labeled completely. And please don't forget to do the back side here. You may work with your group members, but every person is submitting one. I need to make sure you understand this concept. It's the only place you're going to get it. You'll see it again in a lab, but you have to have a basis of Beer's Law to be able to do that subsequent lab. So spectrophotometry, critically important. It allows you to determine concentration from absorbance, and we'll be using the spectrophotometers a little bit later in the year. You've got some time to work on the pre-lab, and you can do so. This lab is due Thursday next week.